Thank you. Thank you all. Please, thank you so much. Thank you. I am, uh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm so, I'm so thrilled to be here and so incredibly humbled after listening to a night of speeches uh, and testimonies from individuals that, in my opinion, are changing the world. I am uh, thrilled also to be, of course, with Michael and Alan and my incredible friend, Jenny Eplett Riley, the founding members of City Year and her kids, um, Aiden and Anna, uh, and of course, my great wife who's with me tonight, Cheryl. Cheryl, I love you so much. Thank you. Cheryl and I, as Jenny said, we have five kids. One of them is a City Year alum. Matt Landrew, New Orleans. He rocked it. Is New Orleans in the house? Is City Year ready? That's what I'm talking about. You know, as I, as I began, I, uh, I was reminded by Jenny yesterday when we were talking about uh, my remarks tonight about uh, one of the things that I might say. And uh, she said to me that you ought to reference one of our founding stories. And it reminded me of a portion of the speech that I gave and the way that I came uh, to a realization that I, even as the mayor of a major American city, had a blind spot and had to act. Uh, and it's the story of the moccasins that all of you know. It's an old great spirit. Grant that I may never criticize my brother or my sister until I have walked the trail of life in their moccasins. That statement, along with Ripples of Hope, uh, along with the Bridge Builder, along with the Starfish, along with the many other foundational stories that you have, all have something in common. And the one theme that runs through all of those stories is the ability to see another human being, to see their humanity, and to try to see yourself in them. And by doing that, learning not only from them, but them from you, and realizing the great answer to the great mystery of life was what is the best way to love? And the best way to love is to serve. Um, in the civil rights era, uh, you have heard uh, the term that you have to speak truth to power, which is true. But in the Bible, it says you have to speak truth in love. Now, if you think about that for a minute, it doesn't say you're not supposed to speak the truth. It doesn't say who to speak the truth to, but it says to speak the truth in love. And if you can't see the other person, if you haven't walked in their shoes, if you can't understand where they came from, you are less, they are less, and you can't find out really where it is we're supposed to go. So in essence, service is a pure act of love that tells us everything we need to know about the virtue of humankind and everything flows from there. And as you think about what you're supposed to do in your life or how you're supposed to be with other people, Essentially, everybody in this room is a human testament to the notion that if I serve, actually I'm the one who benefits the most, not necessarily the person that I'm serving, but of course they do as well. I help transform their life, they help transform mine. Now, I'm a one of nine children. My mama, her name is Verna, had nine children in 11 years. The saint. <laughs> I'm the fifth kid. Now, for all of y'all that grew up with a lot of people, so are, are we together? When you're eating at the table and you have eight brothers and sisters trying to grab your biscuit, <laughs> you got to figure out how to make it work. When you're sleeping on top of each other, anybody from New Orleans who knows this, pre Katrina, post Katrina, when it's wet and it's hot and the house is small, everybody needs to learn how to share. And if you don't have something you want and somebody else has it, you need to learn how to negotiate. This idea 
of pushing people off, not inviting people in. Isolating yourself. Everybody knows makes you smaller. So in my life, in my house, as I grew up of one of five, I learned that sharing and reaching out and being part of a team was a whole lot better than standing off on the side. And as I grew up and knew from work that my mama and my daddy did, always helping other people, that was their life's mission, no matter how crowded the house was, now, how many dogs there were in the house. My grandma and my grandpa lived with us. No matter how little money we had, there was always enough gumbo in the pot. There was always enough rice and etouffee. There was always enough bread for somebody else to get what it is that we had. And we got more because every time we gave, we got. And so as I grew up, when I was a very young man, Cheryl and I met, we both started serving right out of law school both of us working as law clerks for the government. I then ran for the state legislature. And I stand on the shoulders of many people who went before me. If you add up my father's years in public service and my siblings' years in public service, we have served over 106 years of elected office. And that doesn't count Cheryl's work and my brother's work that gets us to about 160 years of serving the United States of America through what we have done. But... I grew up in the Deep South, and race has always been a complicated issue for the United States of America, one that we have not really talked about the right way, one that we have never really confronted, one that we have really never dealt with in a way that heals us as a country, because we continue to have challenges with it today. When Micah was up here and he was showing us banners of stories that were in papers just in our recent past with what happened in Charlottesville, what happened in Charleston. It is amazing to me, even in the middle of 2018, the second decade of the 21st century, that we still have not yet said the very simple words, I am sorry for what has transpired. And so when Katrina hit the city of New Orleans many, many, many years ago. And it got dark fast. Anybody from New Orleans will tell you, 2,000 people were killed. 500,000 homes were hurt. 250,000 destroyed. Savon, all of his family members and friends, and so many of our fellow sisters and brothers strewn across the nation, lost everything that they had in our darkest hour when it looked like we weren't going to have a future, when it looked like we were never going to survive, angels among us, the kind of individuals that Michael alluded to, people who didn't know anything about us people from New Orleans who talk a little bit funny, eat a little bit different, bounce to a little bit different of a backbeat, (laughs) got ourselves all over the country and people invited us in. They did not push us away. They didn't say, no, you're not welcome. No, let me separate you from your mama and your daddy and them. No, you can't come in because you're from a different part of the country and you look a little bit different. They invited us in. In the city of New Orleans, before Katrina, if a white lady was walking down the street and three young boys of color were walking across the other street, they would go in opposite directions of each other. After Katrina, when the water was rising, when it was wet, everybody was getting in the same boat. And I mean that literally. Nobody was asking anybody else, what color are you? What school did you go to? How come I don't know you? Everybody was lifting everybody up. And in our darkest moment, when we thought all was lost, the brightest lights began to shine. And that is when I became completely and totally confident that no matter what the United States of America ever went through, that when the chips were down and we began to see each other as human beings, finding our common ground, that we would find our true purpose and find the best in us so that America could she be the best that she could be. And it is... It is startling to me, it is startling to me that we forget that lesson time and time and time again. 
So Katrina hits, it destroys the city. Nobody knows where they're going or what they're doing. And slowly, slowly but surely, one person at a time, hooking up with one neighbor at a time, bringing together neighborhoods and then communities coming together, we began to rebuild. And we decided that we weren't gonna build back the way we were. Now this took a little bit of courage because if you ever really look at yourself in the mirror, if you ever really spend a lot of time by yourself, that's a hard conversation to have when you ask the question, am I really as good as I think I am? Is there anything else that maybe I ought to be doing better? Do I really want to fight to the death about the way I was and not really worry about the way I can be and how do I get better? And the city of New Orleans asked herself that question. And as we began to rebuild the city physically, people's homes, the roads, the bridges, the playgrounds, the schools, we rebuilt 33 brand new schools. The kids have beautiful physical spaces to go in. We need to start asking ourselves, well, what are we doing in the buildings? One of my favorite singers, Luther Vandross says, a house is not a home. And he's right about that. It's about what's inside of it, not what's outside of it. Not the physical building, but what's in the soul of it. So when we started building back the soul of the city and we started thinking about our public spaces and we started getting ready for our 300th anniversary like we're celebrating our 30th today, we started thinking about this. And, I, and what, you, what do you do? You ask your friends. Wenton Marcellus is my friend. We've been knowing each other for a long, long time. And you know he's like one of the world's great trumpet players, but he's a historian too. And he's a truth teller. He's a truth teller. That's what your friends are. And I asked him, I said, hey man, I need you to help me curate the 300th anniversary. And he said back to me, I'll do it. But like a good friend, needed to extract a little bit, said, well, I need you to do something for me. And he had said to me, you need to take down Robert E. Lee's monument. Now, I'm embarrassed to tell you, in 1960, my father was one of the only two legislators in the entire state to vote against Jimmy Davis' segregation package. We got yelled at our entire life for being advocates of civil rights and justice. But I'm embarrassed to tell you that my entire life, I never thought about that monument one time, other than the fact that it had been there and it was a dude up on a pedestal. And Wenton said to me, have you ever, moccasins. Have you ever thought about it from my perspective? And it was like I got hit in the head with a bat. And then I was ashamed because I should have known. And so as I started to think about it and research it, what I found is the truth. Is that those monuments were not put up to revere at the moment, what any of those guys did, but it was put up to send a message to the African-American community that even though the Civil War was lost, that the people down there were still in charge and African-Americans were not welcome. Now, when you think about acts of justice and injustice, how unjust is it that in 2018 in an African-American city that people need to walk by a statue where there's someone on top of it who led the fight to continue what should have never been in the first place. And as each and every one of you go to schools every day and try to lift children up, can you imagine, as I write in the book, what a young 12-year-old girl thinks when she's walking by these statues and asks herself, why is it there? Now, this is a true story. One of the people that I asked me to advise us, a woman of color that had a child, said, you know, I didn't think much about those statues either until her 12-year-old daughter said to her mommy, what is that statue up there for? And she said, well, and the daughter said, well, who is it? He said, well, it's Robert E. Lee. So well, who was Robert E. Lee? So well, he was a general that fought in the Civil War. And the little girl said, Mommy, did he fight for me? And the mother said, no, actually, he fought against you. You mean he fought to keep me a slave. And if you put yourself in that child's shoes and then ask yourself, what is our role in life? Is it to hold her down 
or is it to lift her up? Can you imagine that when she looked up at that monument that she thought that her life was going to be better? Can you imagine that she looked up and thought that it was just anything in the, in, in the world was possible or nothing was possible? When she looked up at that statue, what message do you think that she got about the direction that we want her life to go in? And so it became clear to me what had to happen and then the process with which to do it. It took two and a half years, but I was shocked. I have to tell you I was shocked because I made a political miscalculation. After figuring out what to do and how to do it and that we could do it, we had to figure out when to do it because you just can't be hopeful about something because hope without smart works and strategy is just a daydream. Y'all want me to say that again? <laughs> hope, hope, hope without good works and a good strategy is just a daydream. So you got to figure out how to do something, not just what you want to do. But I can tell you when Charleston happened, and those lies were taken, I said to myself, you know, America is ready. It's time. It took a lot longer than I thought. And it told me something about where we are in the country right now. Right now in this country for some reason, and I don't know why it is yet, but I'm sure it's so, that we are tearing ourselves apart in an unnecessary way that this notion somehow that we're better when we're separate, this notion somehow that we can isolate ourselves from the rest of the world, this notion somehow that some of us are better than others, irrespective of whether you are conservative or moderate or liberal or whatever we call ourselves politically, this notion that white supremacy has any oxygen in the United States of America is the antithesis of who we are as Americans. And No matter what you think about any policy in America, there is no room for that. And the reason is, is it because it denies other people's humanity. Now, as I sit here tonight, I can tell you with great confidence that there have been very few rooms that I have been in in my life where the individuals in these rooms represent the greatest that America has to offer. And so in this moment, when America is as strong as she has ever been, financially, economically, and militarily, when we are, notwithstanding the fact that there are some violent actions taking place in countries around the world, safer as a world than we've been in a long time, 60 to 80 million people killed, Vietnam, Korea, when, when we as a country ought to be coming together as one, we seem to be splintering. At least that's what it looks like if you watch CNN and Fox and you watch the national news networks. But all you have to do is look around this room and you will confirm for yourself that that is not true. That across America today, in the towns, in the counties, in the cities, in the schools where you live, Every day you see unbelievable acts of kindness and humanity because people are seeking and finding common ground. You will seek, you will find what you will seek. If you seek common ground, you will find common ground. If you commit to it, you know it's there because in essence you know we are all the same. But we have to be able to see each other and hear each other and feel each other and understand each other. The word empathy and justice is really important. When I was growing up and I heard the admonition, where there is no justice, there will be no peace. I really kind of heard that through the ears of, that sounds like a threat. If you don't give me what I want because you're being unfair to me, we might get in a fight. But you know, that's wrong. That's completely upside down. What it really means is that we thirst towards justice, that that is the natural order of things, that all of us are entitled to our God-given rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And when it doesn't happen and we're alienated from each other, we cannot be at peace with one another. We can't share. 
We can't give to each other and receive from each other in a way that makes us whole. And so as we confront what is going on in our country today, which feels like alienation, we have the power to make it not so. You ask yourself, well, how would I do that? Besides exercising your right to vote or protesting or saying whatever it is that you feel about the current conditions right now, that's up there. But on the ground where it matters, when you walk across the street towards someone to help them as opposed to away, when you stay with that child, Michael, late into the night when the system wants to expel them and suspend them, when you go into the criminal justice system where there are a lot of schools and you work with those kids and you give them help, you are choosing to find and to seek common ground. And if you seek it, you will find it. In the darkest hours of Katrina, the brightest light shone when the angels among us showed up. And in my mind, that is who you are. That is what city year is. That is what it looks like to be a warrior for justice, to be an ambassador for peace, and in a very real and deep way, to be a protector of democracy. And so as I close, and you ask yourself in a weak moment, in a questioning moment, in a self-conscious moment, what can little old me do? I mean, I'm just one person I'm working in Ohio or in New York or in New Orleans as a city year service member for a year. What can I do? You need to remember that each and every one of you is a foundation for democracy. That freedom can only come when everybody is seen and everybody is counted and everybody is heard. And so you need to remember the power of one and you are that one. If Michael and Alan and Jenny in that dorm room that day, after they came up with this brilliant idea said, you know what, it's useless. I'm not gonna tell anybody. I'm not gonna go make the presentation. When they went from one person to three and the three became one, and then they began to grow into city year teams. And now we have 29 teams across America, 3,600 of you this year, 30,000 over 30 years. That universe of people all pushing towards the same values, finding common ground, changing lives every day. The ripples of hope that Bobby Kennedy talked about coursing across the United States of America. What would have happened had they walked away? What would have happened if they would have said, you know what, I'm gonna give up instead of not on my watch. And so as you think about what your role in this is, it is to do what you can do. Every day, all day, every day, and don't stop because an act of service is an act of love and the greatest example of our humanity that we can demonstrate. And nobody does that better than you all and city year. God bless you. Thank you very much and have a great night.